This is Ray Mosholder. Dr. Billy Graham is with us from heaven to give us chapter 14, our constant helper. But I, I really wish he was here in my place because he would do this so much better than I do. Chapter 14, our constant helper. Acts 1.8 but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. What makes a Christian different from anyone else in the world? This question, of course, could be answered in several ways. One Christian might say he's different from his non-Christian friends because he belongs to a church. Another might reply that she's different because she knows she's been forgiven of her sins and she's going to heaven. Someone else might say Christians are different because of what they believe. The Bible is the Word of God. Jesus was the divine Son of God who died for our sins and so forth. Still others might suggest that what makes Christians different is the way they live, although a cynic might respond that he doesn't see anything different about the Christians he knows. Each of these contain an element of truth, but they aren't the whole picture. In fact, they overlook the most important truth, one we need to understand as we travel along the journey God has given us. It is this. What makes Christians different from everyone else is that God himself lives within them by his Holy Spirit. When we come to Christ, and we give our lives to him. God actually takes up residence within us. We may not always feel different or be aware of his presence, but Jesus' promise to his disciples has already been fulfilled. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever the Spirit of Truth, John 14, 16 and 17. The night I came forward at the end of the evangelistic meeting to commit my life to Christ, I didn't feel any strong emotion. The woman standing next to me was weeping, and I even wondered if there was something wrong with me because I didn't feel like she did. But down inside, down inside, I knew something was different. And later, I realized it was because the Holy Spirit had come to live permanently within me. The Bible says in Romans 8, 9, If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to Christ. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, God now lives within you by his Spirit. You don't need to beg for him to come into your life if you're a Christian. He already has. You need only to acknowledge his presence and then submit in faith to his power. As humans, we have two great spiritual needs. The first is forgiveness, which God made possible by sending his Son into the world to die for our sins. Our second need, however, is for goodness, which God also made possible by sending the Holy Spirit to dwell within us. 
If we're to live the way God meant us to live, if we're to become more like Christ, if we're to travel our journey wisely, then we both, we, we need both God's forgiveness and goodness. We need the work of the Son for us, and we need the work of the Holy Spirit in us. To the great gift of forgiveness, God adds the great gift of the Holy Spirit. As a friend of mine once said, I need Jesus Christ for my eternal life and the Holy Spirit of God for my internal life. Can the Holy Spirit really change us? Many years ago, a clergyman in a poor part of London became burdened for the dock workers in his parish. Their work was hard, was thankless, and poorly paid, and he decided that if he ever was going to reach them with the gospel of Christ, he must become one of them. Day after day, he dressed like them. He stood in line waiting for a job, never telling anyone who he really was. Finally, one winter's day, he was hired to help unload a freighter moving goods in a wheelbarrow from boat to dock along a very narrow plank. On one trip, he felt the plank rock violently, and he lost his footing and fell into the cold river. Laughter rang out, and he realized one of the men had deliberately jiggled the plank to make him fall. His first impulse was to react in anger, for he'd often struggled with his temper. But almost instantly, he sensed the power of the Holy Spirit overcoming his anger and giving him peace. He grinned and joined in their laughter, and to his surprise, the culprit dropped his load and helped him out of the muck. His tormentor turned rescuer, taken aback by his calm reaction, began talking with him. Later, the man shamefacedly revealed that he had once been a highly respected physician, but alcohol had robbed him of both his profession and his family. The clergyman led him to Christ and in time he was reunited with his family and restored to his position. But here's the point. It would never have happened if the Holy Spirit of God hadn't conquered the clergyman's temper and replaced it with gentleness and the love of Christ. The Holy Spirit made the difference. Many Christians fail to understand this. They know they should be better persons, and they struggle with all their might to change their behavior. But most of their attempts at self-improvement fail, and they end up frustrated and discouraged. They can echo the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, 18 and 19. I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, the evil I don't want to do. This I keep on doing. And what's the problem? Problem is that we're relying on our own strength instead of the strength of the Holy Spirit. We not only need to know how God wants us to live, we also need the power to achieve it. And God has given us that power by giving us his Holy Spirit. He gives us a Bible 
to teach us and other Christians to encourage us. But he also gives his spirit to change us. Not only do we have other Christians around us, but we have the Holy Spirit within us. He's our constant, unchanging companion on the journey. People have all kinds of ideas about the Holy Spirit, some based on the Bible, some not. Some compare the Holy Spirit to an impersonal spiritual force, somewhat like electricity or gravity. Others think of the Spirit only in terms of emotion or feeling. If they think they feel God's presence within them, they label that feeling the Holy Spirit. Still others think of only of the gifts of the Spirit that the Spirit may grant them. These, however, miss the real point. The Bible tells us three important truths about the Holy Spirit. First, he's a person. Get that? He's a person. We shouldn't refer to the Spirit as it, and we should always refer to the Spirit as He, because the Holy Spirit is a person. He has all the attributes or characteristics of a person. He speaks to us. He commands us. He intercedes for us. He hears us. He guides us, and so forth. We also can lie to him or insult him. We can even blaspheme him or grieve him. None of these would be possible if he were simply an impersonal force. But they're possible because he's a person, the spirit himself, not itself, testifies with our spirit that we are God's children, Romans 8.16. Second, he is a power. Now the Holy Spirit is the unseen channel or instrument of God's power in this world. The one through whom God works to accomplish his will. Before the worlds were created, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, according to Genesis 1-2. Job declared in Job 33-4, The Spirit of God has made me. We read of Samson that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power so he was able to free himself from his captors. Judges 15, 14. When God chose Bezalel to oversee the construction of the sanctuary or tabernacle where people would come to worship, he said in Exodus 31, 3, I have filled him with the Spirit of God with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts. Greater still is the Spirit's power to use God's Word to convict us of sin and to give us new birth. Night after night, as I have preached the gospel in different parts of the world and asked people, to respond by giving their lives to Christ, I felt a deep burden for them afterward. Sometimes I feel so helpless and inadequate and wonder if I have done enough to make the gospel clear. But I also know that only the Holy Spirit can open their eyes to the truth. And if we return years later to the same area, 
will often meet people who started their spiritual journey at that moment. The Bible says my word will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Isaiah 55.11 Jesus said, Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Now the Bible also states that you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. 1 Peter 1.23 And once we've been born again, the Holy Spirit has the power to keep us in God's family and change our lives. He is God's seal of ownership on us, guaranteeing what is to come. 2 Corinthians one twenty two. Third, He's God. Did you hear me? He is God. Just as Jesus is fully divine, so too the Holy Spirit is fully divine. The Bible says he is eternal, just as God is eternal. The Bible also says he's present everywhere and is all-knowing and all-powerful. Now again, attributes that belong exclusively to God. Satan isn't this way, incidentally. He's powerful example, but not all powerful. Furthermore, the Bible explicitly declares the Holy Spirit is God. That's Second Corinthians 3.17. The Lord is is the Spirit. On occasion, the Bible calls him the Spirit of Christ or the Spirit of God, again indicating his divine nature. The Holy Spirit is God himself. Just as God is a person, so is the Holy Spirit. Just as God is all-powerful, so is the Holy Spirit. What is true of God is also true of the Holy Spirit, because he is God. At this point, you may be asking how it's possible for the Holy Spirit to be God and also be separate from God. In the same way, how can Jesus be fully God, yet somehow be separate from God, his heavenly Father. One of the Bible's most, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> one of the Bible's most profound truths and one of the hardest for us to understand is what theologians call the Trinity. The Bible clearly teaches that God comes to us in three distinct ways, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At the end of one of his letters, Paul wrote, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. All three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are distinct, yet they're also united as one. We don't worship three gods, as Christians have sometimes been accused of. We worship one God who reveals himself to us in three persons. Now, 
how can we visualize this? When St. Patrick first brought Christianity to Ireland, yes, there is a real St. Patrick, it's said that he used a clover leaf to explain the Trinity to new converts. Three separate leaves combined in only one plant. Others have used the sun to illustrate the Trinity. The sun is an object in space, but it also produces both light and heat yet it is still one. Water can be a solid, or a liquid, or a gas, but it is all water. Sometimes when I go into a church, I notice what are called trefoil, trefoil. Windows, windows in the form of three interlocking circles. Each circle is separate, yet together they form a single design symbolizing the Trinity. The young son of a friend of mine was asking his father how God the Father could be God and Jesus the Son could also be God. Wouldn't this make Jesus his own father, he asked. Children have a way of asking complicated theological questions. They were sitting in the family car at the time, and with a sudden inspiration, my friend replied something like this, Son, under this car's hood is one battery, yet I can use it to turn on the lights, blow the horn, or start the car. How that happens is a mystery to me, but it happens. These illustrations may help us understand the truth of the Trinity, but none of them fully explains it. Ultimately, it's a mystery. We'll never understand this side of heaven. I am often reminded of Paul's words, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. But this is a take away from its truth. We worship as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for that is who He is, the Holy Trinity. As we've seen, the Holy Spirit worked at the dawn of creation, and His work continued throughout the Old Testament. At the beginning of the New Testament, He also, appear, he also appeared. And the angel told the Virgin Mary that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Luke one thirty five. It wasn't until Pentecost, however, following Jesus' ascension, into heaven, that the Holy Spirit came in a special way upon the disciples. Up to that time, Jesus had been physically present with them, but he promised that once he departed, the Holy Spirit would take his place. And this is why the Bible says that during Jesus' earthly ministry, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. John 7, 39. The Spirit's presence would be just as real 
as Christ's presence had been to them. It's instructive to note some of the terms Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit's work. The Spirit, he said, will convict us of our sins. When he comes, he'll convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. John 16, 18. Before we can even come to Christ, the Holy Spirit must first convict us of our sins and open our eyes to the truth of the gospel. He'll also be our teacher and guide. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. John sixteen thirteen. This is why the Bible is so important, because the same Spirit who guided its writing now wants to help us understand it, and apart from Him, we can't fully grasp its meaning. He also guides us each day as we seek God's will for our lives. In addition, Jesus said the Spirit will help us tell others about Christ. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Excuse me. Yeah, to the ends of the earth. Acts 1.8 The Spirit goes ahead of us when we witness, preparing the way, giving us the words, and granting us courage. One of the most memorable men I've ever met came to the United States as a refugee from Soviet Georgia. He'd earned three doctoral degrees, and he held a position at a prestigious university but in spite of that, he felt depressed and unhappy. One day, he stopped at a shoeshine stand and asked the man polishing his shoes why he was always so happy. Humbly but boldly, the man replied that it was because he knew Jesus loved him, and it was because of Jesus that he was happy. The professor scornfully dismissed his words, but found he couldn't escape them. As a result of the man's simple witness, he began searching for God, a search that led to his commitment to Jesus Christ. Later he left his prestigious post to teach at a Christian college that Ruth and I attended, and his life influenced me greatly. That would be Wheaton College in Illinois. And it all began because the Holy Spirit gave an uneducated man the courage to witness to someone with a brilliant mind but an empty heart, a heart that the Spirit had already prepared. The Spirit truly helps us witness. The Bible gives many other reasons why the Holy Spirit has been given to us. We'll explore some of those later in more detail. However, let me summarize them this way. The Holy Spirit has been given to help us become more like Christ. We can't become like Christ on our own. We need God's help. And he's given us his help by sending us his Holy Spirit. Are you trying to live the Christian life on your own? Or are you turning to him each day for the help you need? Pause right now to thank God 
that is come to live within you by the Holy Spirit. Because of him, you're never alone. And that's it. Now, I remember the time, and you want to remember that he said that the actual receiving of the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. That's in Acts chapter 2. And it is a different experience. It's called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And when I received Christ, I thought, man, this is living. But when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I thought, oh, now I know joy and that unspeakable and full of glory. I mean, I was blown away in the wind of the Holy Spirit. And I've been blowing ever since, being blown by his force inside me.